Spectrum and in between, welcome to another episode of the Shutter Show. My name is Ken Stacknick, and with me, as always, is David Marlowe. And not with us, as always, our special guest, Andy Green. Round two. Round hey. two. Round two, Andy Green. Oh, man. I'm feeling as hot as love today. Oh, good, 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 good. my God. Andy, and so you're feeling hot as love, Ken. How are you doing, good sir? I am just peachy keen. That is that that is how I'm feeling today. I am I am I'm full up of preservatives and delicious fruity goodness. <laughs> I thought you were gonna like say like embalming fluid or like like all sorts of different things like took you from the cemetery today. I mean yeah, that no, that's no, a no. way we, to be we on got, theme. We gotta mix things, yeah. We gotta mix things up. Uh you know, it's uh it it it's Halloween season. I gotta I gotta check and move, I gotta uh, you know, keep things uh, lively. Yeah, makes so, sense. So apparently there is a, a game that exists, uh, sort of a, a horror game that exists where you play kind of uh, the mortuary's assistant. Mm. And you're going in, and pretty much your job is to just prepare bodies for burying. And then in between bodies, like, you're Wait, filling out like the paper. Wait, like is this like an Like, is this a tablet game? I, I don't know if it's a tablet game. I think I was envisioning like a game. card game and like was like, how does this work? <laughs> I, can't, yeah. I, I, I can't remember all like off the top of my head what it's called. But like as you go through the mortuary to go thought like file and fill out paperwork. <laughs> apparently the bodies that you are going through are haunted or mm -hmm. possessed by the devil and just weird shit starts happening in the mortuary where you're working. But then you listen to a recording and the mortician's just like, oh, yeah, by the way, this is a thing. You know, I, I just need you to do a couple of things on each body. I need you to learn the demon's name. I need you to figure out just what kind of demon it is. And then meanwhile, the whole time, like while you're working on the body, I can just think is like, why would anyone think that this is the most dignified way to dispose of your body? <laughs> Just like the whole, and they literally, they go through the actual process of what it is, like literally like making small incisions in the side of the neck, inserting tubes, having everything like literally drain out of you and just replace it with this unnatural chemical that keeps your body from actually decaying. So you know so much about this game, but you don't know where or what it's played on? I don't. Or, or what it's yes. called? <laughs> I think it's called the Mortuary's, uh, the, the Mortician's Assistant. Oh, okay. If I'm if sure. I'm not mistaken, it's been like I played it a couple of weeks ago. That sounds uh, like a, a joke that like all the marticians tell. Like it's like the aristocrat joke mm, for like comedians. Yeah. Like ah, you heard the uh, the one about the mortician's assistant, and each one has their own like gag for it. I don't know. I uh... yeah, you, you just keep agreeing that like oh no, that's definitely a thing I've experienced. <laughs> Turns out the autopsy of Jane Doe was all just a prank by Dad. <laughs> It's like six feet under, but gone wrong. Like the just dad horribly, just like, sorry, uh, <laughs> I was keeping the demons at bay. Now you, family, you have to deal with it. I, that'd be a great show. Six feet under, <laughs> but funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good sir, Andy. What are you drinking today? Uh, ooh, I am. I wasn't prepared. I am drinking. <gasps> water today oh, well, I, and, and i have a reason for this i thought about it i have a pumpkin beer in the fridge but i am doing a lot of voice work and need to preserve it beer is not good i know it's a very lame boring but i got to keep you on your toes in a very boring way so that's what i'm doing water today i'm i'm being irresponsible today and sticking with a, a fancy gumball head Ooh. which is a, a from by three floyds ah. uh the title being it's not normal yeah, uh, is, looks is like what they, they claim. Money on the label. Yeah. Yeah. No, it this is one of those beers that's actually kind of hard to get in into, even though it's brewed here. It's it's actually pretty popular. There's a couple people when it goes on sale, you're literally only allowed to grab like two six packs of it. 
So yeah. yeah, Three Floyds is like one of the best breweries in the country, if not the world. Yeah. So good, good work. Ken, what about yourself? What you drinking? Uh, I'm drinking um, Chardonnay, like a uh, lady from. Uh... Ah, yeah. <laughs> like I, the, I'm drinking the Chardonnay. lady of lavender. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 I got real soccer mom energy going on at the moment, which is fine with me. I love that. Some gorgeous soccer mom energy filled with an old creepy man. <laughs> yes, a absolutely. Hey, I am not old. I uh, which which you. I got to say. So the movie that we're talking about, it is it is so hilarious because I, I watched. Uh, oh gosh, what's the documentary called? Fan has. Oh gosh, it's another play on phantasm. Phantasmagoria. Phantasmagoria, thank you. Um, I was watching that documentary um, yesterday and today, and it's hilarious how the old man did not know that he also had a female counterpart. <laughs> and he seemed slightly uncomfortable by it. And she I'm didn't just like, know either, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, neither of them knew. And they're both just kind of like, ah? Like, like when they, like, there were so many, there, like, every premiere of this like like what like of every sequel there's always something that the actors really just don't know that's a key pivotal point in the plot um one of them being that like okay like the woman knew that there was going to be um full frontal nudity but that she was uncomfortable with so they gave her a body double mm -hmm. but her mom didn't know and so like they were just full frontal just everything there and then she gasps, it just she gasps, looks at her mom, and her mom just takes a look, and they're like, "Ah, oh, they should have just used you. Your tits are much better." <laughs> mom, like you know what? You know what? I love that mom. Like that's yes, critical support that is, right there. That is like, mom of the year hey, right there. Yeah, you got great tits, honey. Yeah, uh, yeah. I thought that story was going to end with like her, like the screening being ruined or whatever, because that's like the opening scene, right? That's within thirty-seven seconds. Oh yeah. Uh, so what a cool mom. What a cool movie. What movie, by the way? I think you said the documentary, but what's the original yes. title? Everybody, we are talking about the cult hit Phantasm. Oh, was that the wrong now, one? No, <laughs> Don Costarelli's Phantasm. Mm-hmm. Now, Ken, now how have you seen all of the sequels that accompany this? Or no, what's, what's your experience I, I, with this? Uh, no, so um I am going to be uh very upfront. I am super late to the party with Phantasm. It was one of those movies that I like saw the cover for in Blockbuster, but for whatever reason, I just kind of never got around to it. And then I was hanging out with my buddy, Ben D. Marie, who is also the DP of Sharknado, um, humble brag. And um, <laughs> he was like, hey, have you seen, I, I got the new copy of Phantasm. And I was like, I've actually never seen it. And he was like, <gasps> Okay, well, you have to see it. And I, it is fascinating to me that J.J. Abrams made a movie when I assume J.J. Abrams was three years old, because this is the most mystery. Like, I understand why J.J. <laughs> Abrams loves this movie, had Bad Robot help put it out. It is such. None of it makes sense, but it's pretty cool. And that's why it's fine because nah, don't worry about it. You know what I mean? But it's undeniably fun and cool and there's neat stuff going on. And Angus Scream is rad, even if he's just a weird tall guy. It's <laughs> it, it's a whole you know what I mean? It's well because uh, Ken, like I like I I picked this film for yeah. for Halloween month. Yeah. Um, specifically yeah, because is, I had never, I, I, uh, like, this is my first viewing of it. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, no, this, yeah. Yeah. Our, and this our, is why, this is why we, we had to bring Andy bangers. on. Yes. Yeah, this, no, totally. this is absolutely why we had to bring Andy on because Andy made a mention when we were chatting on Instagram about how big a fan he is of this franchise. Well, I'm like, so, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I am a huge fan of this film. Uh, I've seen it like four or five times now. And it's the same thing where I just, I'm not entirely sure if I can ever tell you what the hell I watched or I have like no memory. It's, it kind of invokes the same, the movie itself. That it's like this nightmare dream scenario, but I feel like I've fallen asleep multiple times. I've like, it just doesn't stick with me, but in kind of a really cool way. 
uh, yeah. except, for, except for the yeah. music, which to me, and I was waving the vinyl, like uh, Fred Myro and Malcolm Seagraves, like I, that sticks with me for sure. But I uh, like, uh, I'm like the kid at like Christmas who staggers presents as long as possible, who like saves the best one for last in my estimation. So with Phantasm, I really liked the first one so much. I actually have not gone beyond it. I'm doing a very long saver uh, experience oh. here, and uh, and I and I, but I did. I have seen. I have seen two, uh, and I and I, but I don't want to talk about that for this one. But I, uh, but yeah. I, so I don't want to come off as like, oh, I'm the king of Phantasm franchise. I just fucking loved this first one. And uh, I also thought it was funny. I was like, Carrie, I'm not an expert at all on, but like, oh, Phantasm, I have the fucking vinyl. Like, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, what, one of the big things that, like, with, with this show that David and I have talked about is we are not interested in having a show where we tell you why stuff on Shudder is something you should shit on. That oh, right. doesn't, yeah. like, that doesn't make any sense to me. To me, I would much rather, like, um, Street Trash is one of, is our, I believe, our first episode. And that to me is a great episode, a great example of what we're trying to do here, which is, hey, um, are you a steady cam operator? Do you like big, long, weird oneers? Well, here's a movie you've never seen everybody steal from all the time, but it contains all of those things. And that is why you should watch it. And this, I think, is a great example of a movie where you should watch it because it it kind of, it, it is a great example of the mystery box that J.J. Abrams sells, which is, it doesn't have to make a whole lot of sense as long as it's kind of fucking neat. And this falls underneath that because it, it, this movie makes almost no sense. Like, every every scene seems like a pitch from someone who's like, how do I keep people watching for the next 15 minutes? And they're like, uh-huh, tits. And they're like, yeah, that'll work. What, what else? I don't know. What if the tall guy's really strong and he can just throw like a whole coffin in the back of a, a, a hearse? Sure. Yeah, that sounds great. What else? I don't know. Flying orb flies in your head, drills oh, your brain man. out. Why? I don't know. Would you watch for 10 more minutes? And the answer is yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes, I will. Actually. Why, why is there a hatch on the island? Fuck if I know, JJ. Just keep the show going. I don't care. <laughs> the, the orb, I feel like, earned me five movies. Like that orb scene is like, okay, I'll see all of these now because of yeah. that first orb kill was just so cool. And then just like the, the cherry on top is, of course, the squirting out the end. Like, just I, the, I really the... hope there's a, there's like episode four is like the Geppetto where he's like, hey, I'm a guy making an orb and I'm doing the thing and he's just a, Which... you know, knocking it together and he's you know he's got he's got creative complaints. Um, that that maybe, that orb. I don't get to make fantasy movies. That orb was not cheap, by the way. I think that orb it was made by um, a local craftsman a guy named uh, let's see, I think Willard Green was his name. It was My he made sake. it for around. Eleven hundred dollars. So that tiny little orb, like, I mean, that's hey, that's about a week's worth of pay for me. <laughs> money, no, no. So, money well so, spent. Money well so, spent. Oh, oh and so it, I mean, one of my favorite one of one of my, my favorite little stories is um. So if you guys have seen Cabin in the Woods, um, mm -hmm. Drew Goddard, the director of that movie, was very insistent that the art department was going to make that coffee. Um, uh, dr drinking bong, it was going to be fucking practical. Mm. So like $6,000 later, <laughs> they absolutely done it. And like, and Drew Goddard was like, look, I understand. I've gotten a lot of emails and Twitter messages from people being like, how can I get this? The answer is it costs $6,000. That's your answer. Leave me alone. <laughs> like which is which is in like which is in like one of those directing things that you hope you can do. You oh, really yes. hope you can, you can in, you you can insist to the art department. No, we're doing it practically. Like one the of the the baby like, Yoda of Cabin in the Woods was just the, well, the yes, collapsible like bong. The, the baby Yoda doll costs like four million dollars, and at one point, John Favreau had to come downstairs and be like, "Hey, um." I know you guys are having fun poking at a baby Yoda. 
I'm going to need you guys to calm down. That costs $4 million. And he just like goes back up to his office, <laughs> which is just the best, most hilarious story. Well, yeah, like you said, though, though, like, though, as the, the director, though the amount of millions that that thing has made the company so far is just oh, yeah. astounding. Oh, yeah. Four well, million now. was a very small. Yeah. At the time, he didn't yeah. know. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> also, yeah. At, at one point, Ken, did you think that Reggie Bannister in this film was Dean Norris? <laughs> Because I totally thought he was a I young didn't. Dean Norris. He I had... didn't. <laughs> I, I, it was one of those things where I was like, am I thinking about this too hard or not enough kind of situation? And I definitely checked an IMDb and I was like, okay, good. No. Okay. All right. I'm correct. <laughs> I mean, I'm impressed with my wife because she was sitting through a little bit of it when I was watching it. And and I was like, oh, I think that's uh, uh, Dean Norris from, uh, from Breaking Bad. She goes, no, I, I don't think that's him. So she yeah, she has better right. eyes than I do apparently, but I think it's so uh, funny. The ponytail is what does it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is a, that is a the business in the front or or business is closed at the front and party mm -hmm. in the back. Um, I, is it one of the most cinematic ponytails of all time? Uh, especially since I know that he shows up in all the other is, ones. <laughs> that is like some eighties die hard ponytail energy right there. Hey, seventy nine though. So he was he brought that to the eighties. Reggie oh, yeah. Bannister did it. It's, yeah, it's thank trends, you, Reggie Bannister. Center. <laughs> thank you. Yes, <laughs> but it's it's so funny though. If you see um, in Faz in Phantasmagoria, um, they're talking about some of the stunts that uh, that were being done in some of the sequels. Uh, one of them, uh, Phantasm Two, where they pull Re uh, the character Reggie uh, up against a wall, like ten feet up in the air. They have his stunt double go in. These stunt doubles. Um, Fake hair is the most, it's just the funniest thing I have seen in a long time. It is just so obvious how fake it is. And that someone pretty much just cut out a shape of like horseshoe shaped hair and just taped it to this bald man's skull and then just said, all right, throw him at a wall. It's just brilliant. Reggie Bannister. His hair just, cannot be created again, you know, like... <laughs> It's really hard. No, and he has to be the only cool ice cream truck driver oh, in yeah. film history. Because <laughs> at this point, marketing for ice cream trucks has not been the best. It's usually just creepy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, that was a huge surprise that he was like the cool, <laughs> the cool uncle kind of character. Uh... <laughs> Which like, like as a, as a kid, you see your uncle like, like yeah, man, my uncle's got it like, Man, he's got it made. He's driving an ice cream truck. He's yeah. playing music on the side. But then you become an adult and you're like, oh, this dude's not doing well for himself. <laughs> well, can he's you having imagine, a midlife crisis. <laughs> can Can you imagine what it would be finding like as an adult now? Like I am, I am, I am out over forty. Um, the idea of finding out that my uncle had an ice cream truck, and I used to think he was really cool when I was like twelve, is like all the red flags now <laughs> like you know what i mean like in retrospect you'd be like oh no 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 there's there's something i must be blotting out here there's no way that ended well like and then that's... meanwhile in great britain rupert grint used some of his harry potter money to buy a fucking ice cream truck <laughs> that was probably like for one scene in the movie like he could turn that around for that profit yeah but what I guess a... <laughs> that's something that Rupert Gritz always wanted to do. Dudes always wanted to own an ice cream truck, which is just like, that's a very strange life goal to have. Yeah. Dream a little smaller, amigo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's already, once you've been Ron Weasley, you just gotta, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's like, I have nowhere else to go. I feel like the ice cream truck definitely could have been used more, but I mean, of course they get to use it for like hauling a corpse, which... I think it was a terrible idea. Like, but you know, like I feel like we could have gotten some music. We could have, I don't know. There was missed opportunity, but uh, I don't know. I think my favorite part though is when he just comes in for like when they're doing exposition time, and he's just like, "Oh yeah, before the kids get out from like what was it, like summer camp, you know, like like that's what his day is is like timing when children come out." Uh, and it's just such a weird, yeah, it's weird. Yeah, what a weird career path to go down. And then you know what? I lied. the The other 
time I've seen like an ice cream truck that where it hasn't no no actually it's been pretty creepy and it was killer clowns from outer space I guess those guys were kind of perverts too they were trying to pick up chicks I was yeah they were very perverty but yeah they got what was coming to them and then of course there's Clint Howard's uh ice cream man uh and that's exactly yeah. what, that's exactly that's what exactly what <laughs> yep that's, Wait, ex which, that's exactly which, the image that comes to mind which one is Clint Howard in well I think it's just I, called the ice cream man or I, I think it's called ice oh, cream what? okay oh. Let's oh see. yes no i think you're right yeah i think it is i scream is it okay let's see let's see live live imdb here this is the same actor from austin powers right by the way when they were doing the whole it looks like a giant yes i think such and such gag and of course I mean, you mean clint howard do you yeah. not know who clint howard is David? rest in rest in peace well, it, there's so many different actors out there that's ron and, howard's that's ron ha brother yeah oh Man, it's that he's in everything. Yeah, like I like I don't know which a, parent he got the looks. Such a funny duality of Ron Howard is like I'm the most milk toast, like <laughs> approvable guy in the world, and Clint Howard is the guy that you cast before Steve Buscemi was Steve Buscemi, and like it's just so funny that they are, like they are the like one is burnt and the other is white. Like it is, it is, it is like it is the the polar opposites of two things. It is, it is very funny. Yeah, that dude. He was. Oh man, he has such a character actor look about him. It is like, like, but I, I, he's one of those. He's, he's the equivalent of like. He is definitely one of those actors like that you would say, oh, that guy who was in that thing, like he should definitely be in that documentary. So the, well, even though yes, like he is the brother of Ron Howard, which I just well, now learned. Well, yes, because also Ron Howard puts Clint Howard in everything because, you know, they're brothers. And he's like, hey, man, can I have some work? And he's like, absolutely, my brother. I will be glad to give you some work. <laughs> um, <laughs> but Clint, Clint Howard is also good. Oh, like, yeah. He's not he's not like it's not like this is a real it's like a Ted Raimi situation where you're like, yeah, but Ted Raimi's pretty great. Same like, I love uh, this. Ice, yeah. I, by the way, I love this ice cream truck. Uh, tangent that we've all veered <laughs> it's off like on. half the episode uh, and it is called ice cream man 1995 and also i was thinking another brother is like james gunn's brother that's another like sean yeah. gunn i feel like he's like on the same wavelength where he's great and he he's in everything that yeah you know, well, he's kind of like a mini any circus and like he's yes. you know he plays rocket raccoon and he plays a lot of like the, the yeah he does all characters. the mocap yep yeah yeah oh uh, but back on to phantasm, phantasm. <laughs> <laughs> well, this this episode should make as little sense as the movie itself. Exactly. It, it's, well, it it's, means it's all so just like, a fever dream. <laughs> yes. It, 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 like, honestly, it is like, it, it feels like Steven Spielberg sneezed in my mouth and gave me the flu. Like, it's not, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's not the best parts of Spielberg, but it's the most parts of Spielberg. Like, it was fascinating. Like a teenager getting in trouble while trying to discover what's really going on. I mean, like, like, like all of the weird stuff in this movie is like all of the weird stuff of the Amblin movies. Like, like when you start talking about what's actually happening in Back to the Future and you're like, Marty McFly is a weird sex creep. And you're like, ah, but you know, Michael J. Fox, this is that exact kind of thing where like, there's a lot of weird creepiness and there's a lot of like leering at girls, but like in, in and Doc is just it's, as creepy. Well, like, so, like, it's all, like, endearingly creepy, if that makes sense. Like, it's, like, it is, it is the idea that is also in the Amblin movies and in Back to the Future and in this, that, like, well, there's, like, being a peeping Tom because you're a horny boy. And then there's like, you know, being a creeper and cranking it out some, outside some girl's window. And you're like, I mean, that's not that big of a distance, actually, but sure. And this movie has that energy. You know what I mean? Where like, it's, it's everything is a little creepy. Everything is a little leery, but it's not overtly awful. Which for a movie in 1979, I gotta give the movie fucking credit because there's a lot of movies we like like Revenge of the Nerds is just a movie where they're like, isn't it funny that this guy rapes this girl? And you're like, no. And they're like, well, you know, the 80s. And you're like, no. 
no. no. And this movie gets <laughs> this movie gets away with it. Is and, and that's the most I'll I'll give. Yeah. You, like you turns know, out, the writer that, of Animal House is actually uh, quite a creeper. Well, Oof. yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know how to segue from this, but I was going to say, like, in terms, I think Mike, like, as being, he's very voyeuristic. Yeah, the kid is, like, watching everything. But it also sort of felt like if you put some logic on, like, a dream scenario, I often feel like I'm sort of just watching, you know? Like, I'm I'm sort of helpless, especially, and then he is, you know, 13, 12, and he, like, at least the movie proper that we find out might not actually happen at all and just be a dream is that, like, his parents have died and his brother is like the last person in his family. So it makes sense that he's like watching his brother like a hawk because it's all he has, you know? Uh, so yeah. there's that. But of course, the added benefit of like he gets to watch his brother like, you know, fuck someone in the graveyard maybe. Um, well, good for you, but bro. Like, it's also, he's like, he's like 13 and there is a age range where I would say like, they don't know what they're doing while it's happening. And then afterwards they're like, oh, actually that was fucked up. And you're like, okay, that was the proper well, response. But because you were 13, you just didn't know how to respond in the, like, like it's that, you know what I mean? Like that's like, that's the weirdness of the morality of this movie that I think I'm talking about is like, it's never done with bad intentionality. Where like, if yeah, the, the idea is there's, there's a, there's a, it's innocent childhood behind it yes. even though at the same time he's riding a motorcycle drinking beer like driving a car like a muscle car i mean firing <laughs> guns macgyvering a shotgun shell oh he's like, a badass a, yeah <laughs> this is a badass 13 year old all right okay. yeah there's a, like a fine line from being very like investigative and like trying to figure out what the hell is going on because i mean it's like the classic like amblin stranger things thing of like the kids are the ones who know what's up like you know, it's the brother being like, oh, shut the fuck up. You know, you're wearing the gaslighting shirt. Like, that's what they're all doing until he sees a finger in the bo in the box, right? That's finally in the mustard. You know, he finally is like, oh, this is weird. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Actually, story, um, story check so out. one of the things I want to bring up is, like, it's totally weird to me, right? That there's just a scene from Dune in yes. this movie. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. And, the and box, like, I mean, not, the direct ends. It's, and it's a box gone. filled with fear. Like, that's just a scene from Dune. They even say, like, fear is in the mind. Like, not fear yeah. is the mind killer, but yeah, like, exactly that. And then the yeah. can the cantina is called Dune's Cantina. Uh, I don't know if you caught that. Yeah, like Don, Don Coscarelli apparently is a massive fan of Dune. And this is before it got turned into, like, a, a miniseries. This is before, like, it was put on screen or anything. So he's, like, yes, this OG. This is before David Lynch's a Dune, Dune fan. Yeah. Which, boy, is that movie insane. It's, I prefer that whole... one to the new one. That's my hot take. Wow, that is a fucking scorching <laughs> take, my friend. Uh, we can talk about it off. <laughs> yeah, no, it, yeah. To me, to me, the new Dune is th this newest one was like, oh, I understand it now. You get you get huge points for that because I've seen this like three times and I've never understood it. Anyway, um, <laughs> we're not talking about dude. We're talking about phantasm. <laughs> This that is this this that is your can you you really hit the nail on the head. That is pretty much this film in this in this whole podcast is it's just a series of tangents that just yes. goes off and then comes back and the audience is like, wait, wait, where are we? What's well, happening? Right, so 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 all right. So I think what this movie really is effectively is a really good haunted house. Like it, like the like nobody ever goes to a haunted house and was like, ah, the story's bullshit. Like, no, the story is this just a fucking haunted house, weirdo. What are you, what are you, what right. are you mad about? Where this is exactly like it's just a bunch of like, what is it? It's like a bunch of spooky, creepy ass little vignettes that all hang together, and it makes for a great time. Is it like? Is it um? You know what it is? It is a uh, is an album of a bunch of great number one hits that isn't a particularly good album, but as a collection of number one hits, pretty fucking great. You know what I mean? Like a, like like a greatest hits album might be a, that band's greatest hits, 
but it's not the experience of them as artists. I kind of feel like that's what this is. Like, this is just a bunch of fucking bangers. Does it make any sense? No. And who fucking cares? That's what I say. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) Well, listen. Well, what was it like? This thing was filmed over, oh, God, like like a year's worth of just, like, weekend shoots between, like, six and eight months of post-production. And it's, I mean, like, like, he made this with a bunch of his friends. Like, his mom was oh god she pulled like triple duty as like a designer uh costumer she also did background extra work on his film um his like his dad was a heavy investor and co-producer of this film um like 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 this this is i will say like like don coscarelli is unbelievably fortunate to have so many people in his corner and he, he has stayed like and this wasn't one of those shoots where everyone is like, there's so much drama going on. So-and-so was just so terrible. This isn't one of those films where you talk about it and he's like, God, what a tumultuous shoot, but look what we got. It's a, man, that was a pretty fun shoot. Stressful at times, but look what we got. This is great. Like, it's it's really fascinating. And he he started, I think, was he still, a, was Don Coscarelli still a student when he made this? He was 23. I think um, when he started directing it, which by the way, Don, fuck you, buddy. <laughs> how dare how how dare you just Don is a hero. Uh man. <sighs> like I would I would put him in the category, and I mean I don't mean necessarily in quality, I don't really care, but like in the quality, like the echelon of filmmaker that inspires me to make movies, which to me is the most important fucking kind of director. Like Sam Raimi, Peter Jackson, like young them, and Don Coscarelli. I think they're like of the same ilk. And like when I watch this movie. It just makes me want to grab a camera and just like, yeah, go make it with like, that's what Reggie was like. You know, that's how I think the actor was like, dude, I just want to do like something wicked this way comes. And they're like, well, I had this dream. Let's do this instead. You know, uh, and Which I he, just, tried, he tried to buy the rights for that, too. Right. But Disney beat him yeah, to it. Yeah, just beat him to it. Which and then like then now he found himself a franchise. Good for him. Yeah. Uh, but like, and you were telling the story about how like Angus Scrim didn't really know what the fuck was going on. But instead of like other scenarios where maybe he's pissed, like he shows up in all the other movies and is a hero. Like, so clearly he's okay with, but maybe not where he saw, thought his career would go, but like. Didn't realize he was in like uh, <laughs> the modern days, like, like solid cult transgender hit film. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's not Which an it, Alec it, Guinness it, scenario where he's just like, fuck this, you know? <laughs> exactly. But it, it, but he, he, he took it like, like, and watching the interview with, with him was really was really kind of charming in that like he was a little weirded out by it but he just kind of took it in stride which <laughs> i'm just like like oh he, like that seems like a cool old man right there who's just kind of like all right whatever that's that, fine if every old man was like that we'd be oh man our world would be so much better like it reminds me of danny devito like when he was on it's always sunny where he's like I don't know what's funny now. Like, tell me, like, like, I want to know what you, (laughs) like you young people, like, I want to follow that. And that like, that's how you learn. That's how you stay vibrant. And now he's like the voice of Jersey Mike's our boy. Like, it's just like funny, but I just, you know, most people are so close minded and he doesn't know. Why why is me greased up crawling out of a couch going to be funny? And you're like, just trust me, Danny. It's going to be the funniest thing. And I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure Danny's like overstating like the level of like, you know, downplaying his intelligence and humor. But I yeah. think the point is that like, he's there to play with, well, to play with kids. That sounds wrong. Well, like, you know? he, like, but yeah. Well, like he's game. Like right, he's willing exactly. to roll the dice on yes. li- like, like, and that's the big thing. Like he's not, like he's the opposite of Chevy Chase, where mm. Chevy Chase is mm. terrified of being the butt of the joke. Mm. Danny DeVito is like, no. I'm going to be so much the butt of the joke. I transcend every. I was oh the my. star of twins. <laughs> yes. No, I yeah, mean, can you imagine if Danny DeVito couldn't handle being the butt of a joke? Like he had to probably get rid of that. Like at age five, you know, like, I mean, that oh would be, that, that's a really funny show. Of yeah. Just <laughs> Danny DeVito being like, like, <laughs> l- l- like a Timothy Chalamet level of like, no, I will be lit from the left side. Thank you. <laughs> I would love to see that. I think that would be an incredible Danny DeVito performance. Like, absolutely. 
Also, mm -hmm. Danny DeVito, Timothy Chalamet as like not twins, but like whatever, like their next version of that would be a great film. Like father uh, and son. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or or I want to see a movie where Danny DeVito comes back is like, I'm you from the future. <laughs> yes. Just to <laughs> Timothy Chalamet and just watch Timothy Chalamet's mind just break yeah. apart. I want <laughs> Timothy Chalamet to be his dad. Danny DeVito is his son. Now that would be like... that's incredible. <laughs> Is, is this what stop Canadian drilling your head oil, Andy? <laughs> ooh, ooh, oh uh, Phantasm, uh, the Jawas, <laughs> the Jawas. That they yes, so weird that two years after Star Wars, there's definitely Jawas in this movie. But though, David, though, David, though they 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 came up with this before yeah. Star Wars was released, so this yeah. is just a huge sure. coincidence. It's sure they, they did. The, this was yeah. it was like the Jawas <laughs> stuff was like filmed before Star Wars even came out. George yep. Lucas and Don had like the same like dreams like coming together, you know. I don't know. Uh yeah, they like they think <laughs> ayahuasca at the same party. <laughs> but like, yeah. then... Also, just just the fact that the fact that Don Coscarelli directed this at 23, but not only that, the first cut that he screened for test audiences like ran over three hours. His first ah. cut was three hours long. Which like, is insane because this movie's like eighty-one minutes, and it it went about as well as you you think it would. It was disastrous. Um, I want to yes. see. I want to see the three-hour cut. So I know it's cut, lost, but yeah. I know it's 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 lost. They've got, they still have. There's a bunch of um deleted footage that you can see, but yeah, a large portion of that footage was lost. And God, I hope they find it someday because I, I think there are, they use it in four, right? They use it in Phantasm yeah. Oblivion. They use some of that footage, which is like, I'm like, that makes me pumped. Like that's baller. Like that's and it's recycling. And man, yeah. <laughs> and Shudder's Shudder's remaster of this, like the remaster Ooh. cut of this is gorgeous. Oh, gorge. Yeah. yeah. Like that, it's so impressive. Th th this movie cannot look better. It, like other than changing the way the movie looks, you know what I mean? Like this is, it was like the most backhanded thing. <laughs> like, like, well, like, so um, um, Escape from New York is a great example of a movie that looks like shit. That's kind of the point. Right. And 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 the 4K transfer is never going to look crisp because it's supposed to kind of look like shit. Same thing with like, uh, or like Texas Chainsaw Massacre is kind of the opposite. It's weirdly beautiful oh it's gorgeous a, yeah yeah for a movie that should be uglies or actually better example last house on the left hmm. doesn't matter if you make a perfect transfer of that movie it's supposed to look like shit and otherwise i don't know what you're like I don't, I don't know what you're trying to do um this movie looks as good as it's gonna get it's and and that's that to me is this is a very scrappy movie punching above its weight like spending all of the money like the man the um uh, what's it called um mausoleum the uh the the burial crypt. right yes like, the 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 house itself which i think was the actual historic dunsmeyer house in oakland california so they used it in a view to kill oh okay yeah like like i i i assume like all of that room is not actual pure marble I assume a lot of that is contact paper. Yes. But it doesn't matter because it looks, looks great. great. It looks incredible. Yeah. yeah. When I read that it was not, I was like, damn, they did great work. Yeah. They like stumbled upon some really beautiful shots in this movie. I think the atmosphere, yeah. the atmosphere of the movie is what I come back to and what I like want to bottle. And that's why I have the vinyl because it's just well, like that little. It's the vibe. Yeah. It, like, exactly. Well, that scene no. when, like, that I want scene the when suddenly. Of this movie. Oh, that the cologne scene, would for be example. Rough. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> go to a dive bar and like like well the lady in lavender will just like come to you immediately and that's when yeah. you know something's wrong like no one's sense of knife in the stomach yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> just but oh no like it's but like like i think kind of like how you're talking about the mausoleum and just like there's just getting these surprisingly stunning shots one of them to me like for example was just that shot where it, it the, the movie suddenly becomes a sci-fi horror film uh, and he's reaching into the portal to their planet. Yes. And just that shot they hold on where he puts his hand in and it just disappears. Like, I still, like, I, I wasn't able to find out exactly how they did that, but, like, 
man, it's just, it's, it's genuinely impressive. And yeah, it's such a 2001 vibe, which I know is what he was going for. But that like, I'm assuming that's like that stuff is where the the series heads, right? Like the other planet where there's like the Jawas and this wasteland and tall man's an alien. Oh, fuck. Like, what does that even mean? I got got some real, oh, this is going to go Highlander route. And man, if you're a big fan of Highlander, do not check out any of the sequels to Highlander. It is not. (laughs) Like that is not well, I'm like man. I love Russell Mulcahy. I love I love the Highlander movie. I will I I will go to bat for that movie. Sorry, man. There is no water down any of those routes. Like I've looked. I <laughs> I, I watched the show. I'd love I'd love nothing more than to report. Actually, the Highlander sequels are dope. Nope. Mm-hmm. That is that is just not that's, how that worked out. That's a negative ten four, buddy. Yeah. Yeah, that that is that is a real bummer to report, sir. <laughs> they, oh my god, there's when it does like make the shift to science fiction. I think that was a that was unexpected for me. I didn't expect it to go the route of aliens. Like that. Granted, this film is not one of those films that really goes anywhere you expect it to go. But so, right. like, what are those small creatures supposed to be exactly? Like, what are those? Those are the victims, like, you know, like the, the guy at the beginning, their friend who dies, like he, they basically shrink them and become his slaves. Like, that's, I think they even say that at some point, like, uh, yeah, like I, thought I, that's I don't know, I like, heard that's what, like, is that what they That's are? what those, like, tanks are, like, the toxic waste uh, barrels. Like, I, I think those are them, like, aging, you know, <laughs> put them in like some fluid and then they come out looking like Jawas. But like, that's yeah, but my like, understanding. This movie is not at its best when it's trying to explain what it's doing. Like that's like pulling Gene Simmons aside and being like, explain what kiss is. And they're like, <laughs> right. No. We're just, we're just <laughs> no. jamming. Yeah. Yeah. We're just having a good time. Why do you like, need man, an what... explanation? And you're like, the more you explain them, worse it gets. Just like, and that's what this movie is. Like, it, it works because it's just like it's it's just a vibe. Which there are I'm so many movies, with. like including kind of like what you were saying, Back to the Future, where if you lay it out, the just lay the plot out on paper, and you explain it, it you just kind of ruin it a little bit. It just yeah. I would you do yeah, kind of to almost moment. all movies. Like I don't know, I don't go to a movie to like have it be expertly plotted and make sense because like that's like I mean reality doesn't really make sense either. But like I don't know, the whole point is to be transported, and this like definitely does that. And yeah, like it's so weird. I think it is like a jam session. Literally, there's like a five minute jam session for no reason other than to have the tuning fork, I guess, foreshadow. Like it's so yeah. it's so silly. I love that scene so much. Like he just shows up in between his ice cream shift and like they don't even say anything. He just takes the guitar out and it's like I was hoping, Ken, you you have yours in the background. I was just hoping like and at some point during this episode you wouldn't say anything and just start <laughs> just, just just start jamming out. Just just be like, hey, and this is what I'm gonna do right now. Just go. Yeah, no, that, uh, yeah, no. That's I mean that's. But it's that's not, the movie. But like, <laughs> but but that's the movie. But the unlike, uh, there is a guy who brings a guitar out at a party and ruins the entire party. <laughs> and this is not that. This is the guy who like brings the guitar out, and you're like, look at you! <laughs> Holy shit! Did anybody know that Gary's good at guitar? <laughs> Fuck yeah! <laughs> You know what I mean? And like, and it's not, it's it's not, they play the guitar so well that everyone's like, you should go to Juilliard. What are you doing here? Like, no, it's just, everyone's delighted that Gary's pretty good guitar. And he played a great little song with a couple of great little limericks in it. And then we all went to bed and it was the best night. And that's- Yeah, nobody played free falling. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nobody was trying to impress anybody. It didn't end with, that guy trying to fuck somebody else's girlfriend. Like he just, just plays the guitar towards yeah, the host's just, wife. It turns out, yeah, it just turns out Gary's pretty good at guitar. And yeah. that was what we wanted before we went to bed. Everyone's happy. Yeah, and, it's, and, it's a, a surprise. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's so funny 
the the actor who plays um Reggie. Oh gosh, yeah, the the uh, yeah. His name is Reggie. His name is actually Reggie. <laughs> yeah. There's there's Bill Thornsberry and there's Reggie Bannister. I'm trying to remember. Um, I think Bill Thorn Thornberry, like like they're both artists. They're both musicians, obviously. Um, there's another scene where they're playing together, and Reggie is is kind of more the primary, um, guitar player in that one. And he's mm-hmm. actually like he's actually recorded songs. Like he's actually like, I think he actually had an album at that point, and he had the most scenes that involved him playing his actual songs. And then there's only one scene with Bill Thornberry. It's like, like, well, it's like, I have this one song. It's like, I'll, we'll play it. We'll jam along. Be great. He plays it. All the rest of Reggie's songs get, all the rest of those scenes get cut for Reggie. And <laughs> Reggie, they're, they're interviewing him. He's like, I'm still bitter about it. <laughs> but it's is, like, is the other the guy? Act- oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go. Because he was the actual musician and the guy who just kind of like pieced together his own little song in like a, like a day or two. The asshole in the Rolling like, Stones oh. shirt and the little fedora. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. <laughs> like the, the the antics on set. Like it sounds like this was just a fun film to make. Yeah. It sounds like everyone just got along. There's um like even like the the relationship between Michael Baldwin and Bill Thornsberry apparently still to this day, um is is spectacular like they they got along so well and like they were practically brothers and it broke uh both thornberry's and baldwin's heart when they didn't recast michael baldwin for the sequel because Mm. uh warner brothers uh man they fucking suck sometimes and Mm. like I, i i get it like too like i think don coscarelli was put in a very uncomfortable position and they brought him back for they they brought michael baldwin back for three and for the rest of the sequels, I think. But it, it's Ooh, something um, to look forward to. <laughs> but like, like during the the scene at the end where the um the mansion disappears like into another dimension, you know, there's all this heavy wind and everything, and the actress, um, oh god, what's her name? Who plays the uh, the Scarlet? The Lady in Lavender. Sorry, the Lady in Lavender. What? Excuse me. The gumball head's getting to me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> You're um, becoming like, the gumball, but it was apparently freezing outside. Um, and all the while she's in this very thin dress, and she's like, "We need to get this done in as few takes as possible." Like I'm freezing my tits off. All the while, Baldwin is behind the wind machine, just taking little pebbles and tossing them into the wind machine, <laughs> and they're going in and pelting all the actors on the other side. And all the while, he's just like a little grim, like. <laughs> All right, so he is that character. All right. <laughs> yes. Oh, he he exuded that energy constantly, apparently. And it's just like, and he's like, you know what? It's like, everyone likes to mention that one. It's like, they don't like to mention all the other fun stories about me because they're all old. And this is the only story that they remember. It's like, oh, so-and-so was throwing rocks into a wind machine. Pelt, pelt. He was also like a kid. So like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's like... And I think like Angus Scrim, because I think he's um Angus Scrim, he he's not originally born in the States, is he? I feel like he's British, just judging by the name completely. Mm-hmm. Although I know that's not his that's his stage name. I do know that, but yeah, yeah, because if that's his stage name, I couldn't tell. I, I like I wasn't sure exactly where it was that he hailed from. But they uh he had worked previously with with Don Coscarelli and he came to him for this movie and he's like, like in this movie, I want you to play an alien. And to which then Angus Scrim goes, great, what country am I from? <laughs> no, no, you're... Not that like, alien. Like, like, like yeah. an alien alien. Oh. Oh, fun. Sure. Why not? Uh, so he was actually born in Kansas City. So... Hey. so really? Yeah, so not British at all. Um, and yeah, we lost him in 2016. No. Oh. Tarzana, California. My first God job in LA it. was in Tarzana, California. God damn. Oh, but yeah, no. Like I, I, I highly recommend like along with this film that folks watch, like Phantasmagoria. It's such a great little documentary, uh, with little like tidbits from all the different um members of production and the actors, and it's it's and then they dive into the sequels later on. Um, and at some point, I might actually 
check those sequels out just out of pure curiosity. But this is one of the first movies where I found a what can only be described as a crushing amount of behind the scenes information, like where my feeling was, look, if you really like this movie, go check out the 50 fucking hours of behind the scenes information that exists. I'm not going to distill it all into 20 minutes because well, if you really are interested, you should just go check it. Like this is there. There's movies that we cover here where we we are struggling to find things to say that we can back up with sources, and this is not one of those movies. This is an incredibly well documented movie, and we should be thankful for it. You know what I mean? Like this is if you want to know what the filmmakers were thinking. That information is out there. The interviews exist. You can go check that out. Where with a lot of movies, yeah, there's a lot of stuff where you find people being like, well, I think this person was saying this. And you're like, well, do you know that, though? And this is one of those, you know, there, there's there's enough behind the scenes information on this movie. You can really find out about the intent, what they were trying to do. And also, yeah, what makes this movie great, which I think is it's. A bunch of, yeah, it, it, every single on this movie is a banger. I don't know how well it hangs together as an album, but. I mean, Andy, happen? Andy, Andy could probably tell you. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, yeah, without the, it makes a lot more sense if you take away the visuals and you just listen to the album. Like, it's just yeah. like, ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, well, I was going to ask you guys, like, I mean, it's obviously comes out before A Nightmare on Elm Street, but to me, like there are some pretty obvious like parallels, even the like grabbing like him from the different things. It's so Freddy. Uh, and I just, I don't know, like I imagine it was maybe an influence, like, or it could be similar to the Jawas where it just was like, they were making it at the same time as this and but same well, Iowa, ayahuasca consider, trip. <laughs> if, like if you consider that, Wes and uh, Wes uh, Craven's first movie is Last House on the Left, which is just a remake of the Virgin Spring, Bergman's movie. Mm. Like it becomes much more of a yeah, no, this guy is that like um, unlike say talking about Hitchcock and Peeping Tom, which was a movie that played in like one movie theater for like a week before it got banned, and maybe Hitchcock saw it, maybe he didn't. But, like, no, Wes Craven has been very upfront. I remade Virgin Spring as Last House on the Left. So the idea then that Don Costarelli is seeing, like, uh, this is the, like, the series of years where these uh, filmmakers are being saturated enough with this stuff that there's a very decent chance that like actually yeah Costarelli probably did see this and then reinterpreted that into fucking uh Nightmare on Elm Street or that Wes Craven somebody who takes movies and definitely reinterprets them interprets them in his new lens stole from this and turned it into uh Nightmare on Elm Street I don't know which direction that went but like this is all the I don't know. All these aromatics are definitely melting together and making the same stew. Right. And, so, and and I think that's just what artists do anyway. Like I, and I wasn't necessarily saying like, Ooh, they stole it or whatever. I just sort of, I, I just like the timing of it. And I think many people see like nightmare on Elm street is like this, you know, the first of its kind in some way, but like just some of the, some of those ingredients were already out there. That's so all. now guys, if, if you had to guess what the budget of this film was, mm -hmm. what would you say it was? All right, so we know the orb was eleven hundred dollars. We know mom had a couple of jobs <laughs> that was probably free. Uh, ooh. I'm gonna guess like a million and a half. Okay, I'll, million I'll, and a half. Right, you can. I'll do. I'll do prices right. I'll say a dollar. So anything under. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Actually, Andy, you're closer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was so granted like there there weren't any accountants on set to really like fully keep track of everything but like it, it comes to somewhere around like three hundred thousand dollar uh three hundred thousand dollar budget um which then ended up netting over 13 million like and, st and still counting you know they got our shutter, they got counting. our shutter money today you know <laughs> oh yeah and it's oh 
which is it, it's crazy that they only I, I don't think they have the 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 other sequels on shutter at this time they, um, ha- they have at least four they don't have two because i looked today um yeah but i think they might have three four and i, I think five was literally a shutter exclusive uh like, like was that one ravager yes i think so yeah okay so it might just be two that's missing um but which two, was, what's yeah. also crazy is that this almost didn't become a cult hit simply because some asshole in the rating at the MP double a decided mm. to uh, like, we're going to give this an X rating. Oh, why do you want to give this an X rating? That's, that's insane. Oh, because when the ball killed that one guy, he pees his pants. Which is like, this movie is so tame. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, this is an R soft R. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. this is a real soft R. It's like real yep, soft nipples, R, but yeah, th- like, some but this asshole, this. Was just like like we don't usually see people pissing their pants when they die, which that was the just, most realistic yeah. part of this movie. Ex- exactly, yeah. that's literally what happens. <laughs> Every everybody pisses their pants, everybody shits their pants when they die. You're not escaping it; it's gonna happen. And it was but like very there was one like person, innocuous. yeah. <laughs> but there was there was a person who was a friend of there was a critic who was a friend of uh, um, Coscarelli's. And he was able to go to that member of the the board and say, like, come on, like, mm-hmm. don't be an asshole. And his response was, OK, yeah, <laughs> that's about right. And because of that, this movie got to be a cult hit. There we go. And now like, and Coscarelli is a cult filmmaker. Like, I mean, all of his films, like Bubba Hotep, John Dies at the End. God, like Bubba sorts. Hotep is so damn good. Yeah. I mean, and there's others, obviously the other Phantasms, too. Mm-hmm. Uh Oh man, Ken, you've seen Bubba Hotep, right? I saw Bubba Hotep in the theater. You piece of shit. That, 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 okay, all right, how, all right. How how that. dare you? <laughs> you, uh, you shut your pretty little mouth. Yeah, how dare you, sir? <laughs> Is this show like sort of David trying to find the movie that he's seen that Ken hasn't? And and like, is that the does, yeah, is that it, the running it, joke? I mean, you found it, Andy. <laughs> well, this, this this whole podcast was built on the concept that that Ken just knows so much more about movies than I do, and it is constantly me trying to get the one up on him. Occasionally, I do, and those are magical moments. Yeah, it does it does happen. But more often than most, Ken is a walking encyclopedia of film knowledge, and it annoys the shit out of me. <laughs> Son <laughs> of a bitch. <laughs> Well, um, I, I like the uh, dynamic. Well, yeah, there we go. Well, on that note, um, uh, Andy, do you want to uh, plug any plugs that you have to plug? Yeah, what you got going on? Ooh, what has changed in a, in a week since I answered this question? Well, I still have a podcast called The Naked Man Podcast. That's right. I am fully clothed, but not emotionally. Ooh, it is just all out naked and vulnerable. Uh, that's on wherever you podcast. <laughs> Uh, and then there's also a, a horror talk show on YouTube that uh, there's like 50 episodes. David is on one of them, House of uh, House by the Cemetery. Um, and that will return at some point this year. I just did not have the life force to do it. Uh, and you got to hop on. It's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. No, we'll, we'll come up with a, a movie for that whenever we'll figure out what theme it is. I got to transform gotta be into a shit. Obscure as shit is Ken, what I like. Just get some Ken Russell's The Devils on there. Oh my God. I've never, I actually have not seen it. So that'd be the perfect. Uh, sure. I love The Devils. Ooh. That movie's insane. Ken Russell's, <laughs> I mean, any Ken Russell that I've seen, I've loved. So yeah. It's like I every every Ken's. sexy nun that you've seen for Halloween, Ken Russell's The Devils was was the basis yeah. of that shit. He's a hero. Yeah. yeah. Does yeah. Does, does she have a hunchback? No, <laughs> not sexy enough. But she is in space. <laughs> She is in Space Jam 2. That she is. Wow. Which, yeah, like, no, Space Jam 2 has the most insane references of any movie. It's like, yeah. But which beyond is, like, that, is that the only reason to see that movie? From uh, it's kind of, it, yes. it's kind of, yeah, it is literally the only reason to see that movie. <laughs> but it's, it's so funny though, because that movie came out around the time we released our episode on Ken Russell's The Devils. And so mm. out of nowhere, that episode got a huge spike in viewership. And we're like, what the fuck's going on? And then mm-hmm. turns out it was because the character of the hunchback nun 
is in <laughs> is in the Space, Space Jam, Jam 2. Movie. It's just a for background no, character. Like for a movie that has not been released on Blu-ray because it is that controversial, they just put this character in the background of Space Jam 2 because fuck us, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, the, the world is a timing on it. Yeah, the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. S- somebody's my best friend in the whole world, and like I want, I want to find that person and just cuddle them. Well, it's like you know that movie for those people probably was like one of the most miserable experiences. They're like, you know what? Let's put the weirdest fucking things we can in the back. Like there was a Devils fan working, and let's. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think that? Do you yeah. think that background actor knew who they were? No. Ooh. Just like, no, I do not. like they're standing next to all these <laughs> iconic characters. Then all of a sudden it's like, put her in this nun outfit. She's like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, I'm probably Julie Christie or some shit. You know, this is fine. <laughs> That's, you know, <laughs> this is some sound of music shit. You're like, no. Uh, I would love if she was going method, you know, like she was just like really in that, you know, like there's a, a murder mystery on set. Like she just, Incredible. I don't know. I'm assuming murdered people in the movie. Uh, or bad things happen from the the nun. Oh, there's many a bad thing that happens in that movie. <laughs> I love many a bad thing, and that's why I'm always honored to be here. So thank you. Oh uh, my yeah. god, Andy! Oh, like we yeah. are so happy to have you here. Like and th- like like Ken said, you have an open invitation anytime you want. <laughs> I mean, I'm just gonna come in, boy, and then just like grab the yeah. mic. Like that's gonna be my. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. <laughs> Now, Ken, Ken, where can folks uh, find find your pretty face, good sir? Uh, well, you can find me on Instagram and on Twitter at, at Ken Stachnik, K-E-N-S-T-A-C-H-N-I-K. You can find us on um, Twitter on uh, at Shutter Show. And other than that, uh, oh, you can also email us at ShutterShow at gmail.com. David, where can they find you? Um, you can find us um, on Instagram at Shutter uh, underscore show. Uh, you can find me at... Uh, underscore dw marlow where i get up to my regular musings uh woodworking projects and occasionally uh a a fun little pictures uh, of me hanging out with my wife and puppy yay wholesome entertainment oh andy thank you so much for joining us this has been just an absolute blast good sir thank you so much for having me until uh yeah i guess until next week everybody go fuck yourselves (laughs) love you Thank you.